Hello everyone, I am Jan Rain B. Duarte. I am Nia Luis Imora. I'm Isabel Maria T. Cadua. And I am Sean Reese O. Bautista. And our camera woman. Hi, I am Zyra T. Pimentel. <laughs> and we are here today to interview Ma'am Amanda Echavaria about her artwork and her life. Hi, good morning. I'm Amanda Fe Chavaria. I'm a practicing artist of Davao City. I also happen to be a curator. I teach art and I also conduct art therapy. Uh, our first question for is, describe your childhood. What kind of daughter are you? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a really good daughter actually. I was quite obedient. I was, when I was younger, I was a very quiet child. And something happened that I became this. <laughs> uh, with regards to parentage, I have a broken family, so I have two sets of fathers. And with both sets, I believe I was good to them. God. <laughs> Also, I had two sets of dads. I was good to them both. It's just that my stepfather who happened to be the part of the year was the one I became very, very close to. Mainly because we are involved in the same field at the same time. He is very present as a father, as opposed to my other dad, who is a medical doctor and has to stay in the hospital most of the time. My stepdad became like the house hospital, okay, so he's taking care of all the things, anything to eat, the meals, the bringing you back and forth to school, so you can just imagine the long amount of bonding we have together. Uh, next question is, what are some memorable experiences during your elementary days? Say again. Memorable experiences during your elementary days. Art related. Anything. I would like to focus on the good memorable things. <laughs> <laughs> and the <laughs> I remember my first poster making contest was in third grade and I was such a shy kid. I was so afraid of going to that contest but my teacher insisted that I go. I didn't know what to do. There was no coaching. I didn't know what to expect. So I ended up crying outside the classroom. My mom dragging me inside the contest place and then I was crying in the middle of the contest and I ended up drawing one big, big, big gray building that was in. I ran out of gray. <laughs> and all the older, older contestants were, were cheering me on. It's okay, it's okay. I was, I was drawing, I was doing the... <laughs> 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 uh, how did you know? uh, how old were you when you already had the inclination for the arts? Like, what were you doing then? When I was five years old, I distinctly remember I was in an Edwardian garden together with my art teacher who happens to be my dad now. And we, we would spend a lot of time together. We would paint together, painting flowers together. And, and yeah, I think that was when I first showed my information for art. How did your parents respond to your time? My parents responded very well, obviously. <laughs> but um, interesting to note that 
I didn't really start with uh, fine arts and my career path in college. I entered the Diliman as a theater arts major, and I was a working student then. And I realized that oh, this theater arts career is it won't make me rich. <laughs> <laughs> This is hmm, maybe I should broaden my expertise here. So I shifted to art studies, and that way I knew I could teach immediately after graduation. And yeah, and then eventually I decided to pursue an art career full time after my uh, around give or take ten years stint in the academy. Um, what were the things you did to develop your talent through your art? When I was in high school, I was already teaching art. I was already teaching art during the summers together with my dad. And because my dad was so sick with the young kids already, <laughs> I ended up teaching them. Which, you know, when you teach, you learn more. That, that's a fact. So, when I started teaching, I got really got into, oh, okay, so this step by step, this is how to do it. And then how to adjust your teaching method for child. And because of that, I had to adjust several things. I also learned a lot of things. Who is your idol in your field? Who is your idol in this field? In this field? I think if you're familiar with uh, artists, art history, you will be familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe is the first modern artist in the US. And she is known for her sinuous curves and minimalist approach in terms of painting. And I idolize her because she made it in the art field. She married someone great. It's <laughs> <laughs> found to marry the man who represented her in the gallery that allowed her to, to flourish as an artist. But at the same time, she really pursued her work. Like, but eventually, in her life, she decided to live a, not to a reclusive life, but a life away from the hustle and bustle of the city. And just keep on painting. That's what I want to do as I grow older. He lived amidst nature and things. Um, where do you get your inspiration to start painting? I start with an idea I want to tell. For example, in my previous Kevin collection. Uh, this one is a part of the Kevin collection. I, it, it was during the pandemic. And I was planning a solo show. And I wanted to give people a better idea of heaven. Of passing, you know. I didn't want to, everybody had this foreboding idea that oh no, we're all gonna die and all that. I for one have a, I'm a firm believer of life beyond and that it's so much better than what we have here. So that was what my series was all about. And it starts with, again, an idea. And then I step out on an idea. I do, I also make a mood board, and I also make my color swatches so that I can plan it out. Um, we actually saw one of your paintings called Heaven Series number two. Uh, what is your comment to those artists who use his or her talent to show this approval to the government? And are you one of them? Okay. So you're, you want to have to ask me what I think about social social realists. Oh, oh my. I think, I think, you know, every artist has a niche and a purpose, just like, just like every other individual. So if that particular artist is called to do social realist work, where it's a social commentary of the government, etc. Et I don't have anything against them. What I do have against would be 
the aesthetic value of their work, if their composition is good, if their if the elements and principles of design is there in their work. I would love their work. But if it's made purely to suffer to get a reaction from people without even thinking about aesthetics, then I begin to question why would you want to put that on the wall? Uh, does it elevate the human experience? Think like that. So I ask you. Among your original works, what is your favorite and why? Among my original works. I have one red piece in Double Doctor's Optimal. It's huge. It's, it's four by five feet large. It's red. And it, it's a huge huge alien flower. <laughs> you know, my flowers, I just make them up. I don't really copy from real life. Although I get inspiration from real life. But <clears throat> I'm also the time makes two flowers together and all that. I find it so boring to copy, some, copy <laughs> something from why would you do that? But of course, there are people who like to do that. For me, I would question why would you want to make something like that? But anyway, this red piece was one of my first major pieces, and I it's my favorite because it's one of my successes with red. And if you are an artist, you will know that red paint is so temperamental. It's, it's hard to handle. It's transparent in certain cases, and it's it's a it's a ulo that kind. <laughs> and yeah. And I believe that I was successful in that particular piece. So. Is it true that an artist is moody, emotional, impatient, and daydreamer? And what's the last one? Daydreamer. Daydreamer. Yeah. Oh, definitely, I'm a daydreamer. I have this zone of moments. <laughs> <laughs> that you will notice that I think it's a common trait among artists because number one. When you say take a walk and somewhere picturesque, the layman or, or the non artist would just wow, this is a, a nice view. An artist's mind would go like, oh, what kind of color is this? What, what kind of mixture would I be doing? Is this the right angle if I make this kind of thing? That, that's where we space out. We think about those things. <laughs> And the other people, look, what are you doing? <laughs> Mixing mentally, <laughs> uh, and yeah. So, so when you're an artist, it's a solitary career. You're alone all the time, and in your in your head all the time. So sometimes it's quite difficult if you spend a small stretch of time being on your own, and all of a sudden you are immersed with other people. You find yourself like an oddball, you see, because you don't operate like the normal, not the normal, the regular people, you know, how they go off in society. That is also, yeah, why a lot of people find us weird, and they also don't adhere to social norms. Why? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is, is having a public exhibit very important to an artist? Why or why not? Of course, it's important. What's the point? <laughs> um, when you're creating an artwork, you're creating sort of like a speech. If you don't deliver your speech in the public, what is it for? Your personal consumption. No, if you're a professional career, you speak to your audience by mounting exhibits. Do you help aspiring young artists to develop their talents? If yes, in what way? And if not, why? Oh, need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> I teach young aspiring artists, I, but I also have a group of advanced artists that I help launch in the art community. So that's the goal for those who are really serious in their career. What I want to do is to launch them 
and find their niche in the art community. But because of course, we I mean, we're not the same, right? I have one artist who is more modern, yeah, in the artist community. Some of them are more abstract or more mixed media. So it's really, yeah, I think it's it's one of the responsibilities for older. I don't want to say. If I say senior, that's even worse. <laughs> uh, for, for, for those who have established careers already, to help out the young ones so that they don't repeat the mistakes that we already did, which, you know, it's not energy savvy to do that. Uh, do you think what sense of the AFI and the So, <clears throat> DAFI or Davao Artists Federation Incorporated is a group of, it's like a federation of around 13 art groups per group and a variety of membership. So, some have a lot, like 50 plus, some have minimal, like six. So, we're talking about around 100 artists, young artists. And it is really, really important. That's why we got together to establish this group to unify the artists here. Because we noticed that ah, there are a lot of blooming artists here, <clears throat> but we are not well represented, say, in the media or in government, in the government. And we need help in terms of finances as well as paperwork because there's really no category say in the IR of a practicing work. So we don't really know where to place ourselves. Unlike but I know for us, like we have a a hold on let me tell you. <laughs> we have a business here so our art practice becomes legitimate. But how about the big body market? How are they going to be a legitimate market? Because they have to sell, right? If you sell, you have to have a business license. But if you have a business license, well, not now. You're already bankrupt because filing for a business license is expensive. <clears throat> Maintaining that one is expensive. So how is the body artist going to survive? Another problem is the lack of gallery representation here in Davao. We only have a handful of galleries here. And most of those galleries prefer established artists. Because sure of income, why would I take one a young artist whom I'm not sure was going to sustain his career? Because for buyers, there are two kinds of buyers. Number one, one buyer is a collector, okay, who thinks of his artworks that he acquired as investment. The other one is for decorating their house. So for serious collectors, it's an investment. Now why would I invest on somebody shady? I don't know if the artwork I'm gonna buy from him is going to increase in value eventually. Right? So you want to invest on something more I'm sure. <clears throat> so, how do you find patronage for your artists? You know, that's what the challenging part, especially if your art is a little weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. <coughs> if doctors treat patients and engineers build structures, what is the role of an artist in society? You know, with the advent of automation, <clears throat> robotics, AI, and There's a lot of jobs that are going to disappear. But, and, and a lot of are afraid, oh no, artists are going to disappear. No, it cannot be. Because art is emotional and it's a spiritual exercise. So, how do you actually you automate something like that? As opposed to, say, computing a structure or diagnosis. Right? So, <clears throat> what is the role of art in the society? It elevates the human experience and it also reflects the human experience. So, 
whatever is in the psyche of the community, you will see it reflected in the art of the people. So it's so obvious. If you see a lot of young artists, they do go to a big, big exhibit. You will notice that these artists are still, you know, trying to find their voices. And there's a lot of common themes like clouds and eyeballs and all that. <laughs> you know, and then you will also see a later generation, even that, even in the, in, even with the social realists. <clears throat> If I have an experience of being relate to the public rather than than uh, compared to that uh, compared to the uh, younger ones. So good. Art elevates the human experience and it also reflects the human experience. What is the role of arts in nation building? In nation, nation building. Nation building. I believe that since you know there are a lot of ways that art can help with the nation building, connected to what I was saying that art is a reflection of human experience. <clears throat> it helps stabilize identity of people. It also helps them understand what's going on, what's going on now. If you see the previous experiences about well, then, uh, as previous. In, in art history, there are a lot of iconic artworks that help establish uh, the psyche of that life. And it's because of that artwork that that point in history was immortalized and it was, you know, it became so potent uh, a part of that uh, time. <clears throat> for the future now, uh, for example, for us, that we we really want to help with a creative, to help develop a creative economy in the Philippines. We want the Philippines to be known as a sort of like a creative machinery. That we have a lot of creatives here, that we produce a lot of viable and, and powerful artworks, not just visual works, but music as well and performance art. Mm. And if you gain that type of identity worldwide, it would be a boom. It would be such a good thing. Just like, say, in, in Bali, Bali is known for a certain type of artwork, or, or in Indonesia, for that matter. It's known for a particular kind of artwork. And when you see that artwork, up to the you know, Chinese paintings, you know that it's a Chinese painting. And it also embodies how they treat life. For example, if you look at the Chinese painting, <clears throat> it's actually a picture of the same mountain, it's just different angles of it. It's like that. So it would be wonderful if we could develop and work towards that creative of the Philippines. Now, back then we were very, very strong in terms of in terms of our Embroidery and, and lace back then in history, right? We were known for that. But unfortunately, yeah, we, the government didn't really push the development of that artistry in Saya. We would have kind of been known for that. Because people were coming here to buy that type of material. But, you know, I to say, so moving on, moving forward. That's what we're trying to do. We're start with that now and maybe it will be textures in the end that will be a very vibrant creative economy. What is your message to young artists who have talents in PC and hopefully in order to be successful in their field? Yeah, what is my advice? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
your own account. You have to have a day job to sustain your art. You know, find, find a job in, I don't know, design or you can teach. That's why I spent 10 years of my life teaching to support my art career. Otherwise, where am I supposed to get the money to buy paints <laughs> when I didn't really have a regular patronage for my art yet? So find a day job. It's okay. It's actually the best way to do it. Find a day job. Number two, <clears throat> learn how to write. Those who make it in the art field know how to write about, about their artworks. Know how to market themselves through their writing. So if you don't know how to express yourself, then it's going to be a little difficult. Especially now, the art market is so competitive. So you really have to find your angle in things and know how to market and market. Number three, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this stigma that artists are more like legal and dirty looking. Oh my goodness. Just sitting on the floor and all that. No, that's not true. And please do not adhere to that stereotype. Because how you present yourself is also some form of packaging. So how you sell yourself and how people perceive you is how they will is connected to how they will perceive your art. So if they think that oh this guy hasn't taken a bath for a week, the baby must be a since Slightly dirty, you know. <laughs> I don't want to put that on my wall. <laughs> or something like that. And, and it also speaks with your consistency and how serious you are, how professional you are in the field. So you don't have to present it. I really insist that. So when you're opening or when you're receiving guests in a show, you better dress to the team. Goodness, you <laughs> own your air. Cut it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Show five works of yours and explain what style and technique you use. Five works. Okay. Each work. This one is Ooh. a. Uh, very minimalist, but the angle is towards our therapy. It's this one has letters that I've written to my eight-year-old self and to my nanny who I grew up with. And because I said, you know, when you're with my background, I will not go into the details. My background, <laughs> my troubled background. <laughs> I had to go through therapy and, and it's one of the things that she asked me to do, to write a letter. And because, you know, I just don't get there, <laughs> I, I needed to incorporate, I decided to incorporate it in a piece. So this is one, I'm still not sure if it's finished, but yeah, that's, I like this one. It's cute. It's pretty. Uh, okay, this one was for a. Uh, this is a oil pastels on felt paper. Um, I made this for a magazine <clears throat> talking about the their spirituality and adoration. I particularly have a penchant for not using human figures to express. Parang parang I like personification. It was literature. So I like personifications a lot. So yeah, I like this piece because it's, it's it's one of those time, and it was made specifically for yeah that that particular magazine. And number one, okay, this one. Well, I'm like, hey, we Sorry. I had a series back then. That was composed of mga people who were trees. And um, yeah, this is what I've heard. This is the last one. We have one more that I really like, but since I'm here, I'm going to show you. 
<laughs> this one is um, it's it's a surrealist piece. So when you say surrealist, it's beyond real. It's like a dream piece. Most of my work have an inclination of the word surrealism, but I do a lot of abstractions as well. I do a lot of texturing as well, which I like. And yeah. Oh, this one too. Okay. This one was for a breast awareness piece. Because I used to make a lamp for a lamp sculpture. This one is a flat one. The only flat one I have. I usually work in cylinders. So this is about breast cancer awareness or for a breast cancer awareness uh, event in Waterfront. I did this one. Yeah, if you can find the lady with her name. So this one is purely abstract, no? I don't almost feel this same nature. But I think the main focus right there here is it's backlighted. I had a phase where I was really fixated with cutouts. I also have several pieces where my paintings have holes and then more cut out. I, yeah. Gusto kong pahirapan yung self ko back then eh. So, <laughs> hirap na hirap ako dito. Ilang sugat pa ko. Yeah. Okay. And, ilan na ako? Ah. Uh, ano si Sarah? Ano ba Sarah? Ay, lang. Because I think it was displayed in a public place, in a healthcare place. I don't want to specific. I don't want to put that institution to be in a hot spot. But you know, after several days, I noticed that okay, there's a trick. Yours to me, Sara. We had an operation. <laughs> um, this one specific for a show that's full of Sarah's. It was a composed of several artists and we just painted Sarah. So Sarah did Sarah. That was before the election, so it was like our way of supporting Sarah and her campaign. And then, uh, yeah, so it was put in a public place and I found, oh, there's this old here. Uh, Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> because once it's damaged, you cannot, you know, um, it's, it's there forever. So, although you can repair it, but yeah, it's far enough. Mm -hmm. And I really think that it is a hater who did it. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious because, I mean, if it was an accident, it could have fallen in other more indirect space, but then it's a Oh, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, some things that people still have to learn is to respect artworks rather than uh, use it to vent their frustrations and anger. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Paul. So that ends our interview for Ma'am Itabaria about her life and her artwork. Bye! Bye.